Hello, Edwina Murphy Druma is my name, and I want to warmly welcome you to this interview in the series that is all about unleashing the audacious woman within. Today, we have with us Chris Edwards. Chris has been an interior decorator for over 25 years. Having started her career in LA, she's done all sorts of interesting things in Hollywood. She then moved to Fiji, where she worked on a resort, and now she is in Australia. So she has accumulated an incredible wealth of wisdom in how we create a space in our homes that fills us with joy. And as I say, allows our soul to settle and feel at home, but using some audacious ideas. Chris, welcome and thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, it's so good to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I, For the women in our audience that haven't met you yet, I've had a little glimpse into your story, so I'm dying to share it. But for those that haven't met you yet, would you share a little bit of your story and how you came to be doing the work that you do now? Okay, well, I'll give you this sort of the, the helicopter view. Um, I started out as a set designer in Los Angeles and I worked on movies and television commercials. And then that was just a crazy lifestyle. So like many people, you kind of go, oh my gosh, what are my transferable skills? So I went um, back to UCLA and did um, interior design. Sorry, that's my dog in the background. <laughs> Oh, rolling funny. around yeah um did interior design and just was in the right place at the right time all you know got hired to design a resort in fiji so found myself in my late 20s designing a resort in fiji um met my ex-husband ended up he was australian ended up in australia and started doing interior design for resorts and high-rise residential buildings and then struck out on my own and started doing a bit of a blend yeah. of both like commercial, you know, do, I do hospitals and doctor's offices and residential. And what I, I'm so lucky, a lot of interior designers, they work in a very defined niche and a very specific style, like you're buying their style, right? Yeah. Whereas I work on $8 million homes and I work on like kind of first home brick and tile, just aspirational, like just help us do a new kitchen. And I love that. I'd die if I had to just work on one and not the other. So yeah. Um, yeah, and my whole philosophy has been all around getting inside my clients' heads, their lifestyle, and designing beautiful, practical, livable spaces, not stuff that's for my ego or for a magazine, right? So I then um, kind of branched out a little bit. I actually design products and sell them on Amazon, and I teach people how to do that. And kind of there was a confluence of, you know, events, and I went, hold on. I'm actually really good at this teaching thing and I love design. So I brought that together and this year launched The Good Room, which is teaching all those people out there that like can't afford an interior designer or seriously don't want one because they rightly are afraid of ending up with an impractical space and losing control. I'm going to give them all the skills that they need to do it themselves. So yeah. that's where I'm at. And I'm so happy and feel so blessed in these crazy times that I have something to do. Yeah, I love that your dog's having a party in the background. It's usually my dog, Pokey. So, you know, like, it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. We've got Normally he's in. sleeping, but today he's just no. decided to, like, grab attention. Yeah, we've got, we've got homeschooling. We've got the dogs. We've got sick kids. It's like it's all yeah. happening. It's all happening. So, I, you know, I feel like this, you know, being in Victoria and I've got lots of clients in yeah. California, all across the world, we've, we're facing lockdown. People are spending so much more time at home. And I just, I love this idea, this opportunity that we actually have a time that perhaps we didn't have before to really look at creating this beautiful bubble that we get to yeah. live in the, the an area that we actually can control so we I call it nesting like yeah. people suddenly look around yeah. and they realize what they're happy with and what they're not happy with and they want to create a refuge like their soft place to fall you know I love that idea and I know that I was inspired to buy salt lamps because every time I go to the health spa 
where near where we are and I you know have these salt lamps the lights are dimmed and it's just like being cocooned it's like this kind of feeling of so creating that space in my own home was was something that I attempted with salt lamps but where do you start where do you start supporting people what are the first things that you look at well how they live not like what do you like what trends are you into do you like blue do you like green no it I, I ask them questions like do you entertain? Do you watch a lot of TV? Do you put your feet on the coffee table? Do you like to um, like read? Are you a person who tends to, the second you get up, open all your curtains and windows? Or do you like a bit of a cocoon? So it's, it's really more about them. And when I tell people to start to gather their vision, it's, of course, it's the Pinterest boards and the Instagram and all that kind of stuff. But it's also to ask themselves, how they live and where they feel comfortable. And they even dream about, like, I think we all have a space from our past. For me, it was my aunt's um, house in Palm Springs that felt magical. And then ask yourself, what was it that felt magical about it? And for me, she just had every square inch of wall covered in art and none of the art matched and it just felt like a gallery. And so that's something, so, so ask yourself those kind of questions. I kind of get outside that box of like, okay, we'll go buy an interior design magazine and tag the things you like. It's, it's got to go deeper than that. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, as, as somebody that does vision boards every year, I often pull out home style magazines because I, I love working on my bubble, but mm. I almost never find something that feels right for me. I've, you know, like I love lots of colour and what's currently trending seems to be um, gray and white. Like lots of neutrals and everything's yeah. kind of neutral, which is I've got orange carpets. I've got a, a green velvet lounge suite. You know, like I love color. That's what works for me. So it is finding those things that, that light you up. Do you, I want to jump in and tell you and tell anybody who's listening, ignore trends. In fact, buy magazines to determine what you're not going to do. Watch the block to figure out what you don't want. Like, yeah. Honestly, the more you follow trends, yeah. the more you're going to want to throw it all out and start over in three years. The more you stay true to yourself and create a soulful, unique interior, the more people will come over and be like, oh my God, that's so unique. That's so brave. This feels so homey. And they feel good there. Not like they've just walked into some sterile show home. Yeah. it's, it's That's so interesting because I feel like... Um, my go-to would be to have a natural palette. You know, like when I walked into the home that I live in now, everything was white. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And I just found that overwhelming. I guess that's being a mum of four. Yeah. <laughs> everything oh white God. just immediately scares me. But is that, you know, like where do you work with um, like wall colours and carpet colours as opposed to furniture and things that can be changed, I guess? Well, I mean, I think that all depends on the people watching. Like if they own their homes, they, they have control over that. And again, um, there is no right or wrong, guys. Like it's um, like if, if everybody's doing quarter lexicon color on the walls and you think it's too stark, then please don't do that. Like, but the internet is a beautiful place for ideas, right? Like, so you could type in on Pinterest warm off-white wall colors and you will get so many beautiful suggestions and pictures of what it looks like and then you start to build your look that's specific to you i'm all about creating authentic design yeah you know not let's impress other people and um yeah and like joining groups like like mind group we have a, a facebook group a private facebook group where people post questions and like 60 people will comment and give them their opinion, including me, like an expert. So you don't have to like be a mushroom in a closet, like get out there and ask for your friends advice and, you know, internet forums and Pinterest and Google, like ask for help. Yeah. I want to say be audacious. <laughs> yes. Be audacious. Be audacious, doesn't it? You don't have to fit in the, in the box of what everyone else is doing. And please don't. Yes. How boring. Yes. Yes, you speak my language beautifully. <laughs> so 
Um, I think we can get caught up in needing to be an expert or needing to be an interior designer. So for people that are having that conversation, do you think we can do this without one? You 100% can. Yeah. Honestly, guys, 95% of what I do is knowledge and skills, okay? It's not like I was like, didn't like come in born into this world with some like amazing gift, right? Like it's something I learned to do. And 5% is taste. But you know what? Like if you have bad taste, if you do it all right, it's going to be the best yeah. room in bad taste you've ever seen and you're going to love it. So what does it even matter? And um, so acquiring those, those skills can be you know, buying a book, taking a course. Like I said, I'm starting a course for that exact reason because I saw a hole in the market for people who really didn't want to relinquish control or couldn't afford an interior designer, right? Yeah. But wanted to acquire those skills. And you know what I hear all the time from people from my clients is I know what I like, I know what I want. I just don't know how to pull it all together yeah. or I don't know where to start. Yep. So that's not some magical gift, right? That's something that you can learn how to do. Yeah, okay. So what are, what are some of the classic mistakes? If we're going to take this on by ourselves, what are some of the classic mistakes that you typically see that perhaps we can avoid? Oh my gosh, there's so many. I have like, not trying to, you know, I've got two free videos, which is one is like the 10 biggest mistakes people make during renovations and the other is the 10 biggest mistakes people make with, when buying furniture. Yeah. So I'll, I'll think of a few of them. Um, one is going with the, like if you get a couple quotes, going with the cheapest quote. Sometimes the cheapest quote is the best one, but other times you get what you pay for and you're not comparing apples with apples. Yeah. They've left stuff out. They, you know, contractors, I love contractors, but some of them do something called bidding the holes, which means if you haven't been extremely specific in every specification, they will quote on the cheapest option. And then when you're like, oh no, well, I want this, um, suddenly the price goes up and up and up and up. Yep. Another one, which seems so obvious, and this applies to furniture and renovations, is um, have a budget. Like, don't just start spending money and you know that like sinking feeling you get like you've been out shopping and you're not quite sure how much you've spent, like manage your budget, have an Excel spreadsheet and then have 15 to 20% slush. And on a renovation, if you don't spend it, if you're really good, you can spend it on furniture or go on vacation because you're going to need it. And with furniture, you know, like you it'll give you the ability to do those finishing touches, etc. But if you set an unrealistic budget, you're going to end up so stressed out with so much angst at the end. It will take away from the beautiful experience of nesting and creating your dream home. Yeah. yeah. Um, another big mistake people make is they tend to think, I'm going to put it like this. Like, so they think, let's say your house on a scale of one being a trailer park and 10 being a mansion, right? Your house is a six. Yeah. Then everything you buy needs to be in that, that kind of budget range, right? That's never how interior designers do. We have a blending of splurge pieces, value for money pieces, and cheap and cheerful pieces. Like every designer has something from Ikea in their house. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. don't ever think that it's all medium. Yeah. The other thing is the, the tidier your deadline and the more impatient you are, the more mistakes you're going to make and the more you're going to end up with not what you really want. So like with furniture, allow three months and with renovations like allow enough time that if you do want to have a variation or you have to wait for that the best tiler you can the more you compress it the, the lower the final result and the higher your stress yeah yep i i'm thinking about um a, an australian um, sofa company that I keep spotting on Instagram and I've popped it on my vision board because it's 10 grand just for the couch. And I was like, <laughs> I know that's going to be one of my luxury purchases. I, you know, it was interesting when you started talking about looking at the life of the person that's wanting to do their home rather than the furniture first. And I know that, you know, we had a couch for many years that it was okay for my little kids to stand on and to eat on. And I just didn't want to spend my time getting stressed about them putting their hands on it. So it was pretty grotty. <laughs> 
But cool. that was so, so my sofa is 10 years old. The kids eat on it. The dog is now finally sleeping on it. It yeah. looks really smart because I picked the right fabric. Uh -huh. And that's the, that's a perfect example of the kind of skill I will give people. Yeah. Yeah. So is that fabric that you can pull off and wash or just? No. Nope. So people think, right, here's a, here's a great little granular yeah. detail of, of, of something to, that you, that should be helpful for people. People are always focused on stain resistant or those, those sofa companies that um, charge you to do the, the like Teflon coating or whatever. The problem is that's fine that it won't stain, but while it's dirty, it looks like crap, right? Yeah. Like until you steam clean it or clean it yourself, right? I want a sofa that actually doesn't show the dirt. And then when I clean it, all the better. So really dark shows everything like lint, watermarks, etc. Really light shows grime, grease, and dirt. So you want a medium color. Yeah. The more textured the fabric is, the less it shows stuff. And the more you have several different, I'm trying to think if I've got one, got one. Several different um, uh, like uh, colors of threads woven together. This is really bumpy. And the more bumpy it is, the less it can kind of like take on, let's say a fingerprint of dirt. Yeah. Yeah. And all of these like blacks, whites and beiges Oh, you could get so much stuff on this. It could really be filthy. And from way back here, you just won't see it. Love it. Yeah. Every mother's dream. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, I wouldn't, I can't imagine having a linen cover, you know, oh, no. stop buying linen clothes for years. <laughs> white and linen. I still wear white, but I just know I'm only going to get about three hours out of it. Yeah. I just like it. That's the designer in me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're in the right climate as well. It's yeah. that warm climate. Yeah. Um, I saw a video on your in your group about doors and choosing the right doors that really spoke to me because it's not something that I actually ever thought of. So let's go there. Okay. Door. Well, this is one of my things where people, I talk about where to spend and where to save. So I say um, doors and door hardware spend and like somewhere where you might save is um, I'm trying to think, Oh, on taps and sinks. Okay. And I can, you know, and I'm going to go into that next, but with doors, it's a first impression thing, whether it's your, um, if it's your front door, it's something that you touch, it's something that you interact with. It's, it's really in your face much more than other things. If you think about it, yeah. And like, what can you do with walls other than for, you know, like art and things like that. But in a house, you typically might have like eight to 10 doors, right? Mm -hmm. So splurging, instead of just having that $50 flat door, splurging on a $200 door that might have something interesting, some panels or doing a feature color and then having a gorgeous handle, which you touch and use. So there's no missing it, right? You touch that handle and use it which is like I say is jewelry for your home, right? That's just jazzed up your entire house, eight doors. You can afford to splurge on eight doors. Yeah. Whereas like then I point out taps and sinks, right? Like typical, let's say you want a beautiful above counter like oval bowl. Yep. Well, you can get one for $100. You can get one for $600. Honestly, Edwina, do you think anybody can tell the difference? They cannot. So like, I would say, don't go to the fancy plumbing showroom, you know, like go to like, you know, or even if you do, I have one that I love called designer bathrooms and they've got everything from like the base level all the way up. And I'll be like, I'll oh, get, what's, get, I want this look for less. And they'll like drag out a catalog. You're like, we can order this one and you know, like a tap for 150 rather than 650 and they look exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I renovated um, the farmhouse where we used to live and in the bathroom and I chose one of those sinks that sits like a, a bowl kind of above the bench. I don't know if it's on a tiny pedestal on the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Which looked gorgeous, but from a cleaning perspective, it was ridiculous. <laughs> Not practical. So so for nine out of ten of my clients, I convinced them to do undermounted sinks. Yeah. Which is a very American thing. And I talk about that a lot like in the course, yeah. I don't just, like the whole point of my course wasn't ever to inspire people, which sounds 
weird, right? Like, I don't want to inspire people. I'm like, there's other people doing a better job of that. Like, watch House and Garden TV, right? Like, I, you don't need me to be like, look how I've transformed this house. Isn't it amazing? Look at this, whatever. I'm like, how, think about how big your sink should, here's the pros and cons. Like, I'm getting into the granular nuts and bolts of the methodology for why you would pick one particular sink over another. Yeah. And I want to shift people thinking to that because then they're going to get the look yeah. and the practicality. They're going to love living in their space, not looking at their space. Yes. And I needed that when I did the renovation. I made some ridiculous choices. You know, with four children, I've got this sink and there was actually wasn't anywhere to put the soap. So then, you yeah. know, like the kids would drop the soap or we'd have, you know, like soap splash everywhere. Oh, water everywhere. <laughs> Such a bad, it looked pretty when it was clean, but it, you know, yeah. like, please don't use it. <laughs> yeah. A bad choice. So one of my other favorite topics is lighting and using Me lighting too. spaces. So let's do that one. Cool. Um, lighting is the, what should I call it? It's everything. It's the deal maker. It's the deal breaker. You could literally spend a fortune on renovating, like, as you said, wall colors, new yeah. flooring, new furniture, and then you do a crap job of lighting and it doesn't feel homey. It doesn't feel beautiful. I have, my whole house is just filled with stuff from gum tree or stuff that I've like found on the side of the road and painted and, and this and that, but I have beautiful like wall sconces, lamp light, pendant lights throughout. And every single time somebody new comes to my house, they go, oh, it feels so homey. It's so cute. There's nothing pretentious about my house. Yep. But, but that's, a, it's funny because interior designers, we kind of get tired of doing all that and buying $10,000 sofas. So we, we can sometimes, like I go for quirky things because I just, like to be a bit different but um the point is beautiful lighting and and i can share if you'd like some of the elements of good lighting yes please okay yeah so um for your i divided into architectural lighting and feature lighting so in architectural lighting um, most people that will be down lights right you don't need that many so think about it you, unless it's a workspace in your kitchen you're going to need a little more maybe one every square meter and you're going to want to make sure that they're over the edge of your bench not behind you so that you're shadowing okay in the living room you don't need that many because i would suggest like i don't ever turn mine on yeah. you might turn on the down lights to get in the house but very quickly you're going to want to shift over to your mood lighting and your feature lighting so don't overspend on down lights what i would do however is um get uh, bulbs, LED bulbs that are about um, temperature of 3,500, which is a warm white. And people over and over again, I have this conversation, they go, oh, I don't want it to be too yellowy, orangey or whatever. Uh, I heard they make daylight. Daylight sounds nice. Daylight's is sunny, right? I'm like, oh my God, daylight is like blue light. It's like your house can look like a supermarket. Yeah. And they make the mistake and, and then and then they'll go somewhere else and be like, this feels so nice. I'm like, because it's all warm white bulbs. You just, please trust me on this. Warm white bulbs, not too many down lights on a dimmer. Yeah. Then you want to add light from at least two sources in a room. Think about a light from one source. It's a flashlight, right? So what does a flashlight do? Very harsh creates shadow. Think about a lighting studio two or three lights from different directions. So when you have diffuse light, unlike a down light, something going through a shade, or I've got some great like basket pendants, anything that breaks that light up from two different sources, fills in all the shadows. And don't you wanna look beautiful in your own home? Like, <laughs> I just like, screw down lights. Yeah. They only make diamonds look good. They do not make 49 year old women look good. <laughs> Like I need lamp light. I need diffuse shades that throw soft light on me yes. and make me look filtered exactly. with no filters. Exactly. Unapologetically so, choosing the lights to enhance my appearance in the home. Yeah. I yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you feel good. You catch you catch yourself in a mirror. You're like, yeah, that's, that's all. That's right. Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> that's so good. 
I um, I'm a big fan of having the that warm light space as well. You know, I talked about the kind of this the reception room at the spa and just yeah. having that pink or that yellow light. It just is. It's. I mean, I think about it from a health perspective. You know, at the end of the day, we're supposed to be working with the circadian rhythms, mm. and you know, not having that exposure to blue light all makes a difference to how we sleep and everything. So, do you have a little? You know, like, do you create little pockets of space in your home, or is that something that you see people do? That's kind of that has that mellowing feel. Well, I just have a lot of clients who, first I want to say, you know, Edwina, why you like pink and yellow light? Because you are at the very heart of it, you're an animal and that is fire. Pink and yellow is fire. And we are naturally attracted to that yeah. at nighttime. When you counteract that with artificial blue light, it feels unnatural. Yeah. We don't look good and we don't feel good. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing my clients do is they want that um flexibility so something for an extra 30 to 30 bucks don't chintz out get your electrician to put a dimmer in you know and then people go all the way to those like c bus systems where they set mood and it's like the fire pops up and the, you know tv goes off and it's whatever and soft music playing i mean like you can go super extreme but just simply like so even in my house i have sort of two different modes. I have, you know, when it first gets dark, I'll flip every light on. And that's when we're cooking dinner and socializing. And my house is like a community center. Literally people come in and out all the time. Um, then as it like hits about 7.38, there's like three lights that I turn off and I light a candle. So I create that second mood that suits that l later time at night. And for some of you, you guys might think, oh, this sounds really labor intensive. But you do other things to make yourself feel good. And you might be surprised at how much this kind of stuff actually makes you feel better. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, um, you know, it's a big thing for me being able to look out at garden space as well. And where um, we are now, the kitchen has a little, you know, like a window. So I'm actually looking at hedge and greenery outside. That's, that makes a massive difference to me. Having some kind of that outside inside feel um, is huge. So there's, um, there's science to back that up. Um, I recently listened to a podcast called The Hidden Brain on NPR, National Public Radio. And um, they, um, they uh, tested people against each other. One who saw some type of greenery, trees, mountains, um, et cetera for at least 15 minutes out of every day and then check their cortisol levels mm -hmm. after three months. And it was staggering. Like people who looked at granary for at least 15 minutes a day um, were less stressed and happier. Wow. Just looking at it. Yeah. So this isn't like, so I'm a real evidence based. I'm not super woo woo. I'm like, I'm like, where's the double blind study in the empirical evidence? You yeah. know what I mean? But so yeah, no, there is empirical evidence that being connected to nature makes us happy. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I can go as woo-woo as you like. I, I know it's true. <laughs> yeah. I know it's true. You, you know it in here, you. in your gut. Yeah. yeah. You touched on, you know, like buying things on Gumtree. I mean, we've got an American audience in here as well. So it's just, you know, the secondhand market. Craigslist. Craigslist, is it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's actually a subject that I feel really passionate about. So I'd love to just dive in there a bit, you know, like where this beautiful plant we're on and we get to look after. And I, I just love a lot of, you know, like everything, a lot of things in my home are secondhand and are passed down from generation to generation. They're kind of treasured pieces, but I always look to secondhand first. It's, you know, it's just something that I do with my clothes as well. Yeah. And so I just, yeah, I want to open up that subject and, you know, looking at secondhand pieces and what your thoughts are on that. I love it. Um, I have to say I have a harder time convincing a lot of my clients. Um, I personally, the ones that are like, um, I don't know, to be honest, a bit, the more sophisticated they are, the more open they are to having like a couple antiques or vintage or like, you know, even just, you know, like some secondhand pieces with a, a coat of paint, right? Because I, I'm going to break it down into a few reasons. Yeah. First of all, 
um, it's, it's more affordable, right? And then you can spend that money on experiences or good food or working a few less hours, right? Secondly, um, it's better for the planet. Uh, much, much, much better for the planet. We don't want this stuff to end up in a landfill and like reusing it, re-loving it, sanding it back, giving it a second life. I don't even need to explain to people why that's environmental. If you don't understand, then you probably don't care. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the eco-friendly, sustainable thing to do. Yeah. Thirdly, I feel that um, those pieces have, they're more soulful, they have character, they, they have a patina to them. So I sometimes think that are, things that are all too new feel literally soulless. Yeah. Whereas I'm sitting at this really old um, desk that, that's got like black water rings that are probably from like the 30s, right? And that's a story. And like allow that story to be part of your house, okay? Yeah. And lastly, the fourth thing I would say is it does make your space look more sophisticated. It makes you look effortlessly chic. It makes you look brave, like that you would have like an old unexpected, you know, armoire that, you know, you keep your books in, mixed in with your ultra modern B&B Italia sofa, like that looks good. If you look at some of the American design magazines and things like that, less so the Australian ones where everything tends to be new, you will see that unexpected antique, that vintage desk with an ultra modern lamp on it. And in the juxtaposition and the tension between the new and the old, you get some magic. Yes. I love that you talk about pieces having soul and that's exactly how I feel. It's actually how I feel about homes as well. I've, I've always lived in older homes and I love them. I love the creaks and the groans and the nuances that make them a home. At the moment, I'm living in a house that's pretty brand new because we moved into suburbia when my kids got bigger and I have never felt at home here. It's interesting. Yeah. I can't, I, it's, it feels soulless. I'm in this suburbia. Everything is brand new and sparkly around me. Yeah. But it's soulless, all these new homes and all this white and all this, you know, so I bring in my crazy orange carpets and my green velvet lounge suite. <laughs> yeah, all, like all my all my rugs are all secondhand, um, like Kilim or Persian rugs and things like that. And you can tell from my house, it's very old. Hold on, I'm just going to yell at my daughter to get the dog. Yeah. Girls, can you help him stop Connor from scratching? They're not even, they're not even, I don't know where they are. <laughs> um, anyway, and I even love, like if I could show you that woodwork, that some of it's chipped and like kind of painted, like I don't even mind that the actual woodwork isn't perfect. Yeah. You know, I like it. Again, it's a story and that might be a shift for some people and I totally respect if people aren't comfortable with that. But I would say if you're creating something brand new, very clean and very perfect, you still want to introduce nature. So for example, it's new, but it's like a gorgeous timber veneer with like crown, um, crown, uh, not molding, crown cut. So you see like the organics of that, or you might do like a polished concrete, which isn't perfect, but perfect. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So in some ways, we don't want to create clinical interiors, even if they are modern and new. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. My husband is from South Africa, from Cape Town. Yeah. And when he moved over here, he created a whole lot of stuff over. It. And one of them was the family dining table, which um, I we have in our home now. And it's actually got burn marks in the wood and it's just, wow. fabulous. it's got so much yeah. story and soul to it. Um, but I love, you know, I love feeling surrounded by those pieces. And I, get just an absolute buzz from going to vintage stores and looking at old furniture and bits and pieces. Yeah. Like, it's all, per it's all personal, but. And it doesn't need to look like, you know, like your Nana's home, yeah. but get something from your Nana. Like I bet you everybody listening has something that they have from their Nana or great grandmother or whoever um, that's in the closet. Cause they think it's really old fashioned. Yeah. And I say, take it out and put it out right like just like one or two little beautiful old pieces yeah. look fantastic and I have just like a piece of coral sitting in that 
and you know it's next right next to like a really contemporary frame and like yeah get those nano pieces out that's what i say a bit of, a bit of personal style bringing your own yeah. personality into your home it's yeah. gorgeous it's gorgeous so I'm, you know, like within this series, there is the potential that people have, you know, lost their jobs and are looking at a career change. So for somebody that's listening to you going, do you know what, I've always loved styling homes or something that I've really loved doing. What's, what's a pathway into the sort of work that you do? Okay, well, that's really interesting. Um, I actually um, have a very good friend who um, is an ex-lawyer and she's, and she kept looking, she just, she, her kids are old enough now where she's think she's, you know, thinking I, I need to work. I can't use the excuse of kids anymore. I want to work, but she just felt sick about like going back to law, thought about mediation, tried it and went, Oh no, I can't do that. Right. And she's always loved styling and things like that. So I said, just start interior design. She's like, I can't, I need to go to school for years. And I said, no, you, you can, you've done all these houses, take those pictures, create a presence, create a website um, and a presence on Instagram, a presence on Facebook and things like that. And she's already started to get a couple jobs Amazing. and I'm so proud of her. And she says, she goes, I've been happier the last three months than I have been the last couple of years. And she was just brave. Edwina, she was audacious and she just oh, needed a little kick up the bum from me saying, You've got flair, you've got vision, put it out there. She create, yeah, create a house profile or something like that, which will put you out there and connect you with people. Yeah. Um, and, if, and if you do in fact have some talent, the skills can be acquired. Now, like the course I teach is for people who want to do it themselves. Yeah. And I could certainly do my course, but if you really want to be able to provide a service and take on some hard skills, like being able to draft up a floor plan to scale and things like that, there's online courses and they don't take that long. Yeah. What I would not necessarily recommend is some of the interior design schools are graduating dozens and dozens mm -hmm. of people who then go for design assistant jobs. And that's a hard slog. And I don't want to discourage anybody who's doing that, but it's a, there's a, there's a hundred applicants for one job. Yep. I would say maybe go around that route, get the skills if you've got the vision and the flair and just create a presence. Maybe offer to do a friend of like a friend's house for free, you know what I mean? And then have them do a testimonial and put the pictures, hire a photographer and put that up on your website. I mean, you really only need two or three kind of different projects and somebody will hire you. Yep. Love it. I love it. Just making a start. We get so caught up in the complexity of how hard these things are, but you just got to have the audacity to go out there and have a go. Well, like, how do you eat an elephant? Yeah. <laughs> One bite at a time. Yeah. So don't think about like world domination. I got some really good advice when I was starting the good room because I was telling um, uh, a, a colleague through that uh, we teach the Amazon students together what, what he thought. And he was like, he's like, <laughs> very nice. He was like, I'm sure you will create have world domination in the design sphere. He goes, but why don't we just take those ideas bring them back down to what's called a minimum viable product, MVP. And some of your listeners might be familiar with that concept and which is, why don't you do a test run with just the smallest product you can create with the least amount of time and money input that is still viable. And if people like it, then next step, next step, next step, create the bigger than Ben, her best ever interior design firm the world's ever seen or whatever, yeah. it is people want to do and that, that can be applied to any business they want to start create yeah. one by the, one step at a time create the minimum viable product get positive feedback from the market and then take step two take the next love it love it and i love that your dog's joining the conversation yeah i'm sorry no postman's probably here yeah <laughs> it's like yes listen <laughs> he's accentuating what you're saying um so do you have a favorite room? Do you have a favorite room that's like, this is the room that I love doing? Oh, doing four people. Yeah. Hmm. That's hard. I really like all of them. Um, I, I mean, certainly the living room because it has the most amount of moving parts. You know I mean? It's got the art and the, 
and the seating areas and the, it's the showpiece to everybody. And it's also the space where you have to actually live. It has to like function and perform. So that's the obvious one, but maybe the less obvious one is um, I love doing outdoor spaces like the outdoor rooms. Cause in Australia, we have a climate that enables us to have the seamless transition between indoors and outdoors. It's a completely often neglected part of people's homes. And by really designing it for the sun, the rain, lounging, cooking, dining, reading, suddenly they've like doubled the space of their home when the outside we extend their living, whether that's, you know, through coverings and furniture or screening and oh my gosh, I, I just die a little design death every time I see that somebody's outdoor space is lit by like a motion sensor light yeah. or like a single mounted spotlight all the time in Australia, right? I'm like, no, we need festoon lights. We need a pendant light. We need wall washers. We need garden spots. We need yeah. to uplight this tree and we need a fire pit. And suddenly nine months of the year, that's their living room. Yeah. I've, I've got to throw in their fairy lights. I, I yeah, fairy lights. Fairy lights. <laughs> I've got to get new ones. Mine have died and they're all wrapped around my frangipani tree. And so I've got to get new ones and, you know. Love. Uh, fairy lights do, they make me happy. We talk about, you know, pulling out the things that bring you joy. Fresh flowers, fairy lights and fabulous food. They're my, they're, and fashion. I've just got all these F words. <laughs> That's awesome. I like those F words. And yeah, fairy lights ever since I was, um, okay, you know, it's just about like reaching to your memories. I remember being a student at UC Santa Barbara and going to this restaurant and all the trees had fairy lights. And I was like, and it wasn't Christmas. And I went, mm -hmm. when I grow up, I'm going to have fairy lights year yep. round. Yep. I'm with you. <laughs> and I never thought I was audacious enough to think that that wasn't tacky. Yeah. So, you know, I even have them in my bedroom. <laughs> you go, girl. Sharing. You own it. You own your personal. I, I own my fairy lights. My husband has to put up with my cushions in my fairy lights. Yeah. He doesn't get a say. <laughs> he doesn't get a say. So I know that you, you've talked about your course a little bit. Tell us a bit more about that for the women that would love to jump in and check it out. Okay. Well, um, I think I'm going to give you a link. I've, it's very new. Um, we have a website called thegoodroom.net and you can sign up there or directly from the link I'm going to give you guys. Yeah. It's um, two major sections sort of sandwiched together for you. One on renovations and we cover all of the nuts and bolts of, you know, how to get started, how to get organized, how to avoid mistakes. And then we dive into each room, kitchens, bathrooms, living rooms, offices, outdoor. And so again, I'm I'm not about like, look at this pretty kitchen and looks pretty kitchen and, and black's really in. I'm like, here are the pros and cons of the four different kind of bench tops you could get and why you might consider going 20 mil, 40 mil, et cetera. Like it's deliciously boring. Do you know what I'm saying? But I'm going to teach you and I'm going to save people from making mistakes and make their spaces perform. And then we get into furniture. So it's again, not so much about this is what's in and this is what's out. It's like all the things you need to consider when picking a sofa, how big your rug should be, how high do you hang your art, how, how high do you hang your curtains, yeah. all lighting, um, finishes, what are the pros and cons of different finishes in your furniture? Yeah. So it's getting really granular and I think the responses we've gotten so far are mostly this course a year ago I made so many mistakes <laughs> so I take that as a compliment yeah. and um yeah I'm really grateful and we're just going to keep adding to it so we're going to do like special events and we're going to start shooting at showrooms we're going to go to kitchen showrooms plumbing showrooms we're going to go to an upholsterer to understand like people like you need to know things like what um, commercial foam is versus like feather wrapped foam and all that kind of stuff. Because in the end, then you're not going to spend $3,000 on a sofa you hate. Yep. Yep. So I love to give 
the women that are tuning really those first steps we've talked about you know consider your lifestyle what is going to work for you and you talked a little bit about pinterest i'm a you know like i'm a vision builder that's what i do so how do you, do you use pinterest particularly to create that first kind of vision of of what people are trying to achieve that's i have to say I don't because I go to like my suppliers and I save things and I create sort of a vision board on my computer for them. But if I were to sort of like nuts and bolts tell you where, what I think people should do, yep. which is um, one, what's your vision? And that needs to be visual and lifestyle. So do those two exercise. Second, budget. Third, research. So research online, go around to showrooms, et cetera. Fourth, get bids if you're renovating or go shopping if you're buying furniture, but don't buy anything, you're collecting information. So go virtual shopping or just go to all the showrooms. Just like you don't marry the first man that asks you out, you don't buy the first sofa you see, I want you to do that. And then the final phase is hiring or buying. So buying a furniture or hiring your tradespeople. So I don't want people to skip over any of those steps because that's where the mistakes happen. Okay. Got it. Love it. We need to put that in a PDF. Yeah. (laughs) So Chris, this is a question that I'm asking all the speakers, all the mentors in this series. If what is the first thing that comes to mind? If I ask you, what is the most audacious thing you've done? And there's probably many. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, You've got to tell us something about working in Hollywood. That always sounds, you know. Yeah. Um, oh gosh. Working in Hollywood, being in like a gangy part of LA in the middle of the night with a rain machine using brown um, hairspray to make like trash cans look dirty for a car commercial. Like, you know, and I just thought, wow, this is a crazy life I'm, I'm leading. Yeah. Um, but definitely the most audacious thing was when um, my uh, old university friend said, well, I'd like to hire you to design this resort. And I was like, great, how exciting. I was just finishing up my degree. So, like I said, late twenties, and and then like a week later, I started working on it. We discussed how much I get paid, and a week later, um, I said, like, so how often do you think I'll go to Fiji? And he said, Well, you'll be living there. <laughs> I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> so I had like, I said, Okay, I just need to think about it. I had to go home, look online to see where Fiji, because Americans have diabolically poor geography i'm telling anybody who's america that you know it's bad like do you know where fiji is is it in the caribbean no it's in the pacific ocean and it's 300 islands not just one island so i was so and then i had never imagined living anywhere but california and i felt that feeling of that i'm gonna jump off this cliff and i just trust that the universe has got a parachute for me and I'm gonna, I'm going to throw myself with all the bravery I can muster at this opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Say, say yes to life. One of our yes. members in this series, Heidi Schleifer, she talks about. She's she did her interview with me on her 76th birthday, and she's an incredible woman. But her, she just says, say yes to life, and that's yes. exactly what you did. That's exactly what you did. It was beautiful. This interview has been an absolute delight and it is one of my favourite subjects to talk about creating what I call our little, our sanctuary or our love bubble or whatever it is. It's this beautiful space that we have control over that we can make absolutely. I talk about, I love walking into a home and you feel your soul settle. Yes. You're in the right place. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much for your time. And I can't wait to dive in and learn more from you. Thanks so much. Oh, thanks, Edwin. It was a pleasure and an honor to talk to you today. Hello again, gorgeous soul. I love, 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 love the idea of opening the front door to our home and walking in and just having that sense of, ah, I'm home. That beautiful, relaxed familiarity 
where your home is set up to support your life and your personality. So of course I want to invite you to be audacious with this, whatever that looks like for you. For me, it's fairy lights, fresh flowers, fabulous food, fashion, my orange carpets, green velvet lounge. I'll take you on a tour one day to see all that. But for now, what are the things that you can take away from this interview and start putting into action right now? I love talking about vision and I would really encourage you to look at creating the vision for what is your ideal. Start with perhaps just one bedroom one room, your bedroom, living room, kitchen, whatever that space is, where do you spend the most time in your home? I think Pinterest is a great place to start and play if you would love some inspiration. So dive in, have fun with this, create a vision that lights you up and makes you feel excited. And then you get to look at how you bring that vision to life. Have fun with it, most importantly. All right, that's it from me today. So much love and bye for now.